Welcome to SJEN TV. Today's topic, folks, might be a little dicey for the children. I would ask that you please let them find another game as you view this program. My name is Matt Logman in studio today with Zachary King. And today's topic is about Satanism. Welcome to SJEN TV. We have a great program today for you. My name is Matt Logman, and my guest today is Zachary King. Zach, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Folks, you might find this a bit disturbing when we start asking Zachary why he's here and the story that he has. It's almost unbelievable, but I think you'll find it inspirational. You'll find it heaven sent by the time we finish, don't you think? Pretty close. Oh. I've heard you speak before, Zachary, and you normally start around the age of 10. How come, why is 10 the, the magic age? Because at 10 years old, that's when I had seen so many of the fantasy movies, and that's when my magic started. That, that's when I really started getting curious as to whether magic was really something I could do or if it was fake. And can you tell the people that we're not talking card tricks? Yeah, there's two different types of magic. There's M-A-G-I-C, which is sleight of hand and illusion, card tricks, things like that. And then there's M-A-G-I-C-K, and it was changed in the way it was spelling by Aleister Crowley, who wanted to make um, there to be a such thing as satanic magic or sleight of hand. Age of 10, and you're already practicing the K in magic. Well, I, yes, but I, I wanted magic to work. I, I was so fascinated with levitation, and levitation is where Satan got me because Superman can levitate. You know, I associated flying with levitation, so I wanted to be able to do that. And you know, the first day of school in the fifth grade, and I was ten years old, um, this kid came up to me and he said meet me in the bathroom at the first break. So that was at 10.20 in the morning, and I went into the bathroom. There's 49 other children in there, boys and girls, and they say we're going to turn off the lights and chant a phrase into the mirror, and if we do it right, the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror. And, you know, I thought, okay. I mean, you know, I'm a little naive kid. Sure, let's do this and see what happens. And we did the phrase, the lights are out. We chant this phrase X number of times and suddenly this scary face appears and 49 kids run screaming out of the bathroom. And there was one, one idiot, now I can call him an idiot because it was me, decided, I did this. I said a phrase 11 times and suddenly this scary face appeared. And yeah, I thought it was the spirit of a burned victim. I didn't know any better. I didn't know it was a demon. I thought, I made this happen. This is the coolest thing ever. But notes got sent home because kids started getting hurt. I mean, we're like in a panic to get out of the bathroom. The door's only so big. Yeah, the door's only so big and there's 50 of us. So, you know, they send notes home and say that, you know, if you're caught playing this, you'll be suspended for three days. You know, I had to take that note to my dad, and he wasn't too happy that the note got sent home. And I, I lied and said, no, I, I never do that. And then I started playing the game at home because, you know, that's so much safer to bring the demon into your house. And, um, you know, when I was at school, I played it once a day. But now that I'm playing it at home, I'm playing it every chance I get. And I'm playing it as a result about 25 times a day. Zach, was the face always the same? Yes, and, so it and was it the was, same demon. It was the same demon. It was a very dark skin, uh, snarling. I mean, I, I didn't know any better that it wasn't a spirit of a burn victim because it looked like somebody that had been blackened in a fire. So your youth, you were brought up in the Baptist faith. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And at no time did you think what you were doing was okay or was wrong? Um. Because you My, kept it from your folks, obviously. Right. Well, you know, you don't let your parents know everything. And, you know, my Baptist preacher, we had been taught that 
uh, Jesus defeated the devil 2,000 years ago on the cross, and the devil is no threat. And we were also taught that the devil was afraid of the Baptist church. You know, so I mean, if, if you don't think the devil is attacking you, then whatever satanic attack you're getting, it's open season for you. I mean, it, that's happening to you every day, but you're not believing it's the devil doing it. So you think you just have a spirit of a burn victim. Yeah, spirit of a burn victim and everything's okay. All right, so let's continue from there. You're still 10 years old. I'm still 10 years old. And I'm really, you know, I'm also, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons every weekend. And I'm always the wizard or the sorcerer in that. And magic consumes me. I, I want this to be real, but I don't know if it is. And finally I thought, all right, I'm gonna do a magic spell in real life. You know, yeah, it, it, al it always works in the game, but that's a game. And it always works in the bathroom when I'm doing the chant, but I don't know if that's a magic spell or not. So I thought, I've gotta do a magic spell in real life. I, you know, I don't like my weekly quiz, but I don't wanna hurt anybody. I just thought, you know, if I could get some cash, that would be cool. So I did a spell for money, and, and I got my spells out of the D&D &D book. I thought if I did this in real life, I mean, maybe it'll work. So I did a magic spell for money, and the next day I went out and I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. And I thought, all right, that's kind of cool. I mean, this is 1976, so comic books are 15 to 20 cents, candy bars are 20 cents, and penny candy is a penny. I thought, you know, $5, I can get a, a good amount with that. A little bit high on the hog. Yep, but this could have been a coincidence. So the next Friday, I did the spell again. And the next day I went out and I found a $10 bill on the side of the road. I'm pretty excited. In eight days, I got $15. And, you know, I'm thinking I can nickel and dime my way up to being a millionaire. But, you know, still could have been a coincidence. So I did it one more time. And I thought, if I do it this last time and it works, I'll be convinced magic is real. So, but I did it in my bathroom because... I did the magic spell about halfway into it. I stopped. I did the Bloody Mary chant. And then when the face showed up, I made sure it knew I was doing a spell for money. You know, and I thought, I don't know what this face is, but maybe I can harness this. Maybe Does I can move use this. or talk or at least voice anything? Nothing. It just appears. It just appears and it's just kind of like just floating in the mirror. That'd you know, scare me. <laughs> I was stupid. You know, I didn't know I was supposed to be scared. And um, so, I, you know, I, I made sure it knew I was doing this spell for money, and then I finished out my money spell. And then the next day I went out, and I'm playing. And I was in a large, unpaved parking lot, and I found what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. So I stuck that in my pocket, and I went about playing. And later that night, everybody's in bed asleep. You know, I'm in my bedroom and I've got a sheet up over my head and the flashlight in my mouth. And I'm just like all excited, what is this treasure that I've got? And I unravel a bunch of rubber bands and it looked like Monopoly money because I had never seen a $100 bill. And when I unraveled everything, I had 10 $100 bills. And I mean, knowing that I'm worth $1,000, all my stuff that I wanna buy is dirt cheap and I can do this spell every day. So what did you do with the money? I hid it in my room. Uh, I had a piggy bank in my room that my parents would never open up because they know there's just nickels and dimes and quarters in it, so you know they don't need the money that's in there. And uh, my piggy bank was about this tall. It was tall, uh, red plastic. It was a, a giant pig. And I, um, I put it in that, and then I bought whatever I wanted every day. I mean, I'm worth $1,000, plus I could do the spell as often as I want. So you have a lot of material goods coming into the house. How does that get played off? Well, my, my parents had money. So I, I had, you know, my mom had bought me like 20 pairs of shoes. So now I have 25 pair. You know, I had a leather jacket, but now I have two. You know, I have jeans that I want, and belts that I want. I, I, I had a giant walk-in closet. So do you have like so, a best friend that you shared any of this with uh, as far as yes. what's going on? Okay. Yeah. I, um, 
because I thought that was cool. It's not, it's no fair, it's not fun to have a bunch of stuff if you can't tell somebody. Or brag. Or brag, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want to be able to tell. Plus, a lot of my friends now see, I mean, I was a little nerdy kid, so I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I mean, I played D&D &D all the time, so all my friends there are older kids, and um, suddenly I have money all the time. I have anything I want whenever I want it, and, you know, and they know my parents don't do that. They buy me what I need, not what I want, but I've always got money to go get a candy bar or multiple candy bars, a box of candy bars. You know, I can buy pizza for my friends. You know, I now have more friends than I've ever had because I have money. Oh, yes. You know, they're not really my friends, but, you know, I'm a little nerdy kid with What no about friends. the face in the mirror? Did your friends, did you tell them that you see this? No. Obviously, 49 other kids knew it was possible. Right. But my method of, um, of doing this was that I told my friends that I could do something for them, too. I could get them money. And, or I could get them things, but I didn't tell them what I did. They just knew that suddenly they had money or I had money and they would give me a percentage of it. By working your spells for right, them. Right, right. Entrepreneur. Yes, but they didn't know what I actually did. All right, so let's continue on now. You're 10 years old, fifth grade, living high on the hog. Yes, and, and thinking that, you know, I could do this you know, my favorite car at that time was a Lamborghini Countach, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a Lamborghini Countach, and, you know, I'm not thinking, how do I get to the Lamborghini store? How do I get my Lamborghini back home? My dad has to drive the car. There's insurance. I'm not thinking of any of that. I'm just thinking, you know, I'm looking at it from a 10-year-old's mentality. I'm going to go someplace and buy this car, and that's going to be my car for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, I can do this. And, and I was doing, you know, I talk about that being my, my spell, you know, where I got $1,000. But I was doing those spells almost daily. It didn't matter that I had $1,000 in my piggy bank. I know that eventually I'm going to run out of money. So I was constantly doing those spells to see what else I could get. Now, when I was a kid, $1,000 is the most I ever got. I usually got 10 bucks or 5 bucks, But it, it, that doesn't stop you. I mean, you know, the, the, the devil makes a promise to you, kind of. Like, you know that if you're doing what the devil wants, the devil will give you something. But it's never fair. A little bit of the truth for the big lie. Yeah, and you know... He's telling you that, you know, yes, you're going to get rich doing this, but you don't. You know, you're, you're doing everything you can do, but he's giving you $5, sure. $10, $20. So we got some poor choices going on here, oh, though. So, so now you're being led into, a, I guess, a group of people that you well, admired from afar? When I was um, this kid, I used to play D&D &D with a large group of kids, and one of the kids that I played with, I used to go to school with, and then he stopped going to school, and he stopped playing D&D, &D, and I thought he moved. We just stopped having any contact with him. And then when I was 12 years old, the, um, this kid came back. You know, we were like, hey, where'd you go? And he said he was being homeschooled. And, you know, I didn't even know there was such thing as homeschooled. You know, and he's being homeschooled, and... He said that he plays D&D &D with a group that thinks magic is real. Well, that kind of, you know, that kind of intrigued me because I know magic's real. I know this is something you can really do. And he tells me about this place. Like, my house, we've got a 19-inch color TV in the living room and a 13-inch black and white TV in my bedroom. Over there, he tells me about they have this 50-inch projection screen TV. And, you know, at my house, you know, I've heard about ways that you can watch movies at any time. But even at that time, it wasn't called a VCR. And, you know, we don't have one of those devices. I think it's a reel-to-reel. -reel. We don't have one. But this place, they do. You know, and at my house, we can watch TV. Like, we can watch a lot of Disney stuff. So we, it's a G-rated movie. 
anything that's PG rated, my dad has to vet it first. You know, he has to make sure that it's okay for the kids. But over at this other house, you want to watch a PG rated movie, an R rated movie, that's fine. You know, and they have X rated movies and X rated movies in it with kids in it my age. So there's adults and chi or kids yeah. at this house. Yes. Is it like family or just like a commune or? It's a satanic coven, but I'm not realizing that's what it is. So it's like, it's sort of like a youth center for the town. And oh it, it's not an official youth center. I mean, it's not like, you know, the, the city or the whatever, you know, they haven't officially said this is where you can go to hang out. But there's so many adults there all the time. And there's kids there all the time. Some of the kids are the kids of the adults that are members, and some of them are just kids that go there to hang out. I mean, we had, like I said, my parents had money, but there were kids there that they sometimes would show up and say, we don't have food at our house. And so these people would take groceries to the house, or somebody can't make their mortgage payment, or they can't make their car payment, or they need a car, and these people would donate money to them or help them out. There was always something, I mean, if I had a fight with my parents, I could come here and they would help me, like, counsel me, you know, and, and talk me into going back home. You know, your parents are not bad people, you know, they just have this, their style, their way of raising you. You know, but my parents, as I explained, my parents are the no police. No matter what I wanted to do, the answer was always no. You know, the Moody Blues are coming to town. Can I go see them? No. There's a new movie coming out. Can I? No. You know, I'd like to do this. No. Dad, no. You know, it didn't matter what. I mean, I, I sometimes think that if I had asked my dad, can I live strictly on vegetables, he would have said no just because I wanted to do it. What part of the world, country, state, where'd you grow up at? Florida. Florida, okay, so it's not the Midwest, because I think a lot of Midwest people would think, you know, I'm not letting my kid hang out there if I don't know <laughs> these people, but yeah, things were different back then. Yeah, they so, were. I mean, this is before the internet. This is, you know, TV shows weren't that bad. I mean, you know, my parents talked about how horrible things were, but I mean, the, 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 the worst we had back then was like Three's Company, you know, which if you look at Three's Company versus any show we have now, it was very innocent. So you have access to movies that you shouldn't be watching. Right. People who think magic is real. Right. So how do things progress from here? Well, you know, I had been uh, a victim of a sexual assault when I was 11. And that was at the hands of a female teacher at school. You know, nowadays you hear about this stuff almost every day. But when I was 11, that was 1977, and you didn't hear about that kind of stuff. So when that happened to me, and I was told, you know, it would be my fault. If I said anything, I would be in trouble. I'd be expelled. I'm going to prison. You know, it was my idea to do it. And obviously I enjoyed it. So, you know, if I'm caught, I'm getting in all, these, all this trouble. And so what gave me comfort and solace was magic. You know, but there was no one I could tell. You know, there's nothing I could tell about that. So then when I'm 12 years old and I start going to these, these other coven meetings, which I don't know as a coven, but, you know, I'm, I'm practicing magic and I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm eating potato chips and candy bars every day because they're saying yes, you know, and I'm going to concerts and I'm going to movies. And, you know, 12 members, we had, I went to the, the, one of the largest Baptist churches in town and we had, I think, 12 deacons. 11 of my deacons belong to the Freemasons, and 11 of my deacons belong to my Satanic Coven. So when my parents would drop me off, they know all the deacons. They know most of the kids I hang out with because I go to school with them. They know pretty much all the adults, the, the women. The, everybody that's there is somebody that's known by everybody in town. Sounds like the whole town was in on it. It was a good number. I mean, it was... Um, my coven had between 120 and 150 members at any given time, and my entire town has between three and 5,000 people in it. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's in a sense not a huge coven in some ways. In other ways, considering 
how many people were in the town is a good percentage of them are in the coven. And we had more than one coven. We had two covens in the town. Hmm. And one of them had mean kids in it. And I knew them. I'd been bullied by them. So I knew not to belong to that coven. You know, and this coven, I mean, I'm, I'm being told that if I want to be in movies, like what happened to me when I was 11 was terrible, but now I can get my power back, which we don't have. No one has power. But, you know, I was told that um, you know, I could get my power back, that I can have sex with anybody I want. Nobody can tell me no. I can tell anybody no that I feel uncomfortable with. You know, and plus I'm being given everything that I want. And, um, you know, so I'm participating in a lot of nefarious things. And um, at some point an older kid told me that I was a member of a satanic coven. And I thought, hmm, no, I'm not buying that. I've seen all the creepy movies, you know, and there's creepy music that plays and when the bad guy's on the screen. You know, like when you watch the old Adam West Batman series, when the bad guy's on the screen, the screen tilts. The bad guys are crooked, you know, and then when I Batman's on the that. screen, you know, then it's back to seeing how things really are. You know, and I thought, I'm not seeing anybody crooked. I'm not seeing the bad guy. You know, Satan's letting me eat candy bars and pizza for dinner every night, and I can come over for sleepovers whenever I want, and my parents are okay with these people. Of course, I'm not telling my parents what's really going on, but, you know, I'm, everything's acceptable. Everything's okay. So you and, don't believe it's a coven, and then you ask someone. Yeah, I got, um, after a couple of weeks of then starting to notice what's happening, how some people dress, some stuff that they do. Uh, there's events that happen sometimes late at night that I'm not allowed to come to. And I'm asking why. Now, I, I hadn't asked before. I didn't care. But now that somebody told me it's a satanic coven, now I'm like, well, maybe that's why I can't come late at night because there's... So why didn't you run? Because Snicker bars are my favorite food in the world. And they're letting me have all of them I want. You know, they're letting me do anything I want to do. Um, you know, I went up to an adult that I trusted and I said, hey, you're going to laugh, but I heard this is a satanic coven. Crazy, right? And I kept, I'm waiting for him to burst out laughing. But instead he confirms that it's a satanic coven. And, you know, then I was scared, you know, and I was like, uh, am, am, am I a member? No, would you like to be? See, and now's the moment where I'm thinking about running, but not seriously. And I'm addicted to porn. At the age of 12. At the age of 12. And Snickers uh, bars. You know, and Snicker bars, yes. So I'm addicted to porn, and you got to be 18 years old to buy porn. I'm 12. You know, I'm smoking cigarettes almost every day. Gotta be 19 to buy cigarettes. I'm still 12. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm drinking almost every day. I'm getting drunk almost every weekend. And you gotta be 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. And I'm taking illegal drugs at least on the weekend. I don't know where to get that. And if I stop going, I'm having sex every weekend. I'm liking having sex every weekend. If I quit this coven, I'm not going to get to do any of this stuff. Now, the people that they supplied for this, were they adults? Were they kids your age? or For drugs? For sex. For, for the sex, um, adults bought it. I mean, I, you, know, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm winning. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having sex every weekend, and this is the coolest thing in the world. And all my friends at school are wishing they were having, I mean, kids were making up lies about stuff they oh, were sure. doing. They probably didn't believe you at first. Well, I didn't brag on that a lot because I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want anyone to say, well, Zach, I heard you were having sex all this time. You know, I didn't want somebody to come and actually confirm that something like that was happening. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't bragging on that. But, you know, there, there were some of the girls at school knew me from the coven. And they would flirt with me openly, 
in, in front of everybody. You know, they would kiss me in the hallway, you know, or hug me or do something that they shouldn't do. You know, and all my friends were like, whoa, what's, what's going on there? Wasn't he a geeky, nerdy kid at one right. time? Right, right, right. You know, right. and suddenly so I'm cool. I think the coven knew what they were doing. They're kind of reeling you in, giving right. you all these things that a 12-year-old boy in America would, even though they know it's wrong. Right, right. So, so um, you know, when, when I thought about everything I would lose, you know, I'm losing all my privileges if I quit, you know, I was like, all right, so what has to happen? What, what do I have to do? And they told me there was 13 steps involved and I had done almost everything already. So what I had left to do, I had to slice my left thumb because it's closer to your heart and you have to bleed onto a document. And then you have to sign the document in three places in your blood. So the blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. And I sign that. Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And I signed that, and on the final page of a five-page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. Um, it's impossible to do. I mean, if there's anybody out there that thinks, I can't be redeemed because I sold my soul to the devil, you didn't sell your soul to the devil because it's impossible to sell what you don't own. But I was 13 years old and didn't know any better. So I agreed to sell my soul to the devil, and then... I went to a coven meeting where the entire coven was there and I was in a white robe. It signifies you're losing your innocence and you're baptized full submersion in a vat of human blood, pig's blood, and human urine. Um, you come up out of that, you go into another room and take a shower and come out in a black robe and it signifies being baptized into a world of darkness. Um, they sit you in a chair and they give you a wheel, it's about this big around, and it has a crucifix in it. And they read off the document you signed the night before. You show your thumb to show that it is your thumb that you sliced, it is your blood. Then you spin the crucifix upside down, signifying human sacrifice. You put your, arm, your hands on the arms, and then you break them downward. Supposedly this denounces Christ. And then we have a party to celebrate that I'm now a Satanist, except the reality is that you're celebrating one day you're going to die and burn in hell. And you had no apprehension to just jump into a pool of this stuff that most kids would think, no way. Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's gross. And on the other hand, I didn't see anybody urinate in the thing. I was just told that's what was in there. And it's blood. Clearly, it's blood because, I mean, it's blood. You know, it's a big bad vat of blood. But, you know, I watched horror movies. I, I wasn't grossed out by it. It smelled like blood. And I cut my own thumb to, you know, to join in on these guys. And, you know, it was at a time when we used to watch cowboys and Indian movies where people would bond with each other by slicing their hands and, and then become blood brothers. And that was no big deal. That was in so many of the movies, the westerns that I watched. And, you know, watching that I now have to be baptized in the blood. Well, we got to hear about being baptized in the blood every Sunday at church. And you were how old at this satanic baptism? I was 13. And did you share this news with anybody or just your coven no, friends? No, just my coven friends. I, I thought that if somebody found out that I got baptized into a vat of blood, that might go poorly. Were you still going to Baptist services at the time? I was. Okay. I was because I didn't have a choice. My parents took me and my brother every Sunday and at times every Wednesday as well. And then there were events that happened sometimes on Friday night or on Saturday night. You know, my parents wanted me to have as much God in my life as I could. And I, I didn't like going. It, it, it seemed to me that every sermon, no matter what the Bible verse was, had to do with money. Uh, it wasn't just the, the offertory. It was, I mean, if they read Jesus wept, you know, and I remember the sermon, Jesus wept because he saw the state, the future state of the church and saw that people didn't donate enough money. You know, and finally, when I was about 15 years old, our, our um, church service would broadcast live on the radio. 
And I told my dad one day, I said, if I go in and there's one more sermon about money, you don't have to bother to come pick me up. I'll be home in like 15 minutes. I'll just walk home. I, I don't want to be part of that anymore. I can't stand it. Why is every sermon got to be about money? There's no way that entire Bible is about donating money to somebody. You know, and especially not the Baptist church since the Baptists weren't even around back in the Old Testament when this was written. And you've got the magic to conjure it up. Right, right. And um, so one day when I was about 15, um, I got home, I walked home, and my mother said, your father is really mad at you. I said, why is he mad at me? I didn't make the Baptist preachers tell the sermon about donating money. And then when I walked inside, my dad was telling me that I was shallow. And I said, I'm the shallow one? I'm not the one that did another sermon about donating money to the church. You know, and I never went back. You're watching SJEN TV. Jackery King is our guest today. My name's Matt Logman. Brothers and sisters, you now realize that we're talking about a Satanist. And I promise you, it will get better as he experiences the mercy of God. That that's the best way I can put it from the story that I did here. But a lot of people now would want to ask you lots of questions. Like, okay, you're in a coven, Satan type. What kind of things are you seeing that might be supernatural? What, what are people, be, are they just being desecrating and, 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 and filthy, nasty, immoral? Or do you, are you, do you see things like people being possessed? Anything along those lines? Possession is a, a regular thing in the coven. They, they believe that if you can get possessed, it makes your magic stronger. And I was scared to get possessed. And I had seen some crazy, creepy movies, and I, I saw possession, and I, I didn't want any part of that. But, you know, I, I, I was tempted by it because my magic was pretty good. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm able to... So it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't a requirement, but, but, you know, they, they tease you with it. You know, like, your magic is good, but wouldn't you like your magic to be stronger? You know, wouldn't you like to be more successful? You know, but it's, it's in a way it's hard to tease you with something after they've already given you, like, everything. You know, like, I mean, I'm, I, I was having sex until I was uh, 16, and then I grew a mustache and I aged out of porn because up until then I looked innocent. I looked young. You know, I was fresh-faced and all of that. So they had you starring in the porn movies right. as they were manipulating you and making right. money off of you and feeding you candy bars. Right. And then, you know, it's how I didn't get fat, I don't know. <laughs> and then, and then um, you know, eventually I grew a mustache and then suddenly no one wants to see me perform anymore. And that's, a, uh, that's depressing. I was, um, I, I, had, I had attempted suicide when I was 13 and again when I was 17. And even in the coven? Even in, in the coven because I went from being in demand to nobody wanting my films anymore. Oh my. You know, nobody wanted to see me anymore. And I went from being super popular to being unpopular, but no more unpopular than I was prior to the coven. I just wasn't as popular as I used to be. Doesn't sound like good popularity here, though, but... Right, it's, it's, it's not a positive thing, but, you know, you, things are happening, and especially bad things are happening to you. You're not studying them. You're not seeing what, what's the underlying root cause here. You know, what's really happening. You're not looking at any of that. You're so you just, speak of magic. What other spells besides the money, which I understand, although I would not go that route to get it, Right. But what other spells were you doing that were successful that you could say, my mag magic is good? Um, I did magic spells for sports teams. Uh, now, I only did them because I was gambling. I was betting on them. And, you know, when, when you're contacting, like, a bookie, I, I was using an adult to do it because I'm 
13, 14 years old and I sound like I'm nine, you know, so I don't have the voice to talk to an adult and say, hey, I need, you know, whatever put down on, on this team or, you know, whatever, what is the spread on this or whatever, you know, but I've got an adult that's doing it for me. But I mean, if I'm going to truly gamble some money, I'd like to win. You well, know, so everybody likes to win. So gambling. I'm so I'm doing magic spells for um, certain teams. And this was taught to you. How do you come up with a magic spell for a winning sports team? Um, the same way you do magic for anything else, you just um, modify your magic spell to fit what you're doing, what you want. Um, but you know, I, mean, I also I liked things. I liked um, my first album I ever got was "Schools Out" by Alice Cooper. And I think that was six ninety nine. You know, that's I'm giving away my age now. You know, six dollars and ninety nine cents for an album. Um, the next thing I bought from that I think was Kiss Alive too. And you know, it was a double album set. It was before CDs. And Kiss was like the coolest rock band in the world to me. I mean, all these guys wearing costumes and and makeup and. Um, and it just fit into I wanted stuff, you know, and that's I. So many of the magic spells I did. I mean, I even did. Um, I got uh, an Atari. My parents bought me an Atari, as my first gaming system, but they only got me Tank and something else. Like the two games that came with it, they never bought me anything else. So I went out and bought like every um, game that I could. I enjoyed Tank. I do recall that one. I'm, I'm a couple years older than you. Uh, tank was fun, especially when you bounce the missiles off the walls and, and mm. destroy the tanks. And All right, so you're doing magic, winning money off of sports teams, gambling. Right. Things obviously get darker quicker. Right. What happened? Um, you know, I, had, I was told that we were going to have um, a sex party, and it was going to be all the males age 12 to 15, and a female coven member that was 19. And the purpose was to make her pregnant, and we were going to do an abortion about eight or nine months later. And I said, cool. And then I went home, because I didn't know what abortion was. And you know, I had to look it up, and the dictionary I had was so old, it didn't have the word abortion in it. And so I went to the library, and I looked up books on abortion, and I found two, and both were about two inches thick. You know, and like I say, I, I use cliff notes to get through Shakespeare. So I am not gonna read two inches of material to find out what the word abortion means. So I went back to my satanic coven and I said, hey, I heard I've gotta do an abortion. I don't know what that means. And the guy said, well, you're, killing a baby in the womb. You know, and I was like, is that legal? And they specifically said that you had to do this abortion? They I mean, well, got all these kids that are partaking in this act. I'm one of the main magic practitioners of my coven. So when everybody joins the coven, when you start out joining, you're in the white robe. And everybody then progresses. When you're officially a member, then you're in a black robe. And most people that wear the black robe, there's a red inverted pentagram on it. And everybody wants that. Everybody wants to be an official member. But the robe I wanted was a red robe. And that's the person that does the magic. And you know, anybody can do magic, but if you're wearing the red robe, then you do the official magic. When somebody comes to your coven to say, I want to hire this coven to do a magic spell for me, it's the guy in the red robe that does that official magic spell. And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, magic is the coolest thing. I'm consumed by it. And that red costume looks so much cooler to me than the black. All right. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting to do that. And um, the party ensues. And then eight months later, they say, um, you know, now I'm in um, a big room. Um, there's like 150 members of the coven there. Now there's a separate part of the house where there's, um, there's children in that room, but they're not part of the coven meeting. 
their job is they have a contest to see who can be up till 3 a.m. Because midnight is the witching hour, 3 a.m. is the devil's hour. And they want to, if you can stay up till 3 a.m., you win a special prize. And I mean, you're winning like so an So when you're saying children, these are under 12. Yes. Because the 12 to 15 year olds are obviously right. adults in the cousin's right. eyes. Right. Wow. So I don't know if anybody stayed up to 3 a.m. or not. I, that's, I'm not with them. Um, in this room, which has like, um, uh, I think it's called a great room. In the great room, there's, um, there's a bathroom at the end of the hall or at the end of the room. And then, and that's where we can take showers and things like that. But at one end of the room is a bunch of men that are chanting and saying incantations and their job is to keep Christians away from us. So they're saying things, spells or incantations to the devil to please him, to keep us, to keep the Christians, the cops, whoever, from showing up. There's 50 women that are on the floor that are swaying, saying our bodies ourselves. And it's just a chant that they have going the entire time. Then there's the 13 members, it's 13 high priests and priestesses. They start off around a Baphomet statue and then they end uh, around surrounding the woman that's on the birthing table. And there's me and I've got the red robe and a surgical mask and gloves on. And I've been practicing for a few weeks with like a ball of Play-Doh, an orange or an apple and a scalpel. Now, although I have this stuff, I don't really know what I'm going to do. And my job is to get blood on my hands. It could be the woman's blood or the baby's blood. But again, I, I, there's not like a video I can watch that shows me what I'm supposed to do. Thank you. I've just been told, you know, right. this is what you have to do. You have to get blood on your hands. Okay. And then there's an abortion doctor and an abortion nurse there. And there's full medical equipment. So, I mean, it all looks official to me. I don't know. I, at that point, I'd never been in an abortion clinic, so I didn't know if this was actual, you know, equipment or things like that. And um, at, at some point, we did, uh, the doctor performed a late-term abortion. And I'll, I'll spare your audience because it is a disgusting procedure. And, um, and then he ripped the baby apart and threw it out to the women on the floor who cannibalized it. And um, I, my legs were like rubber. I, I had gotten blood on my hands, uh, but I still didn't even know I was doing the right thing. Um, you know, and we had done, uh, the, there's a spell that works up to this. And then once the spell is complete, then you do the abortion. So we did the spell and we did the abortion and then the event is over. And you're the magic guy. So what was the spell you were doing up to this point? There was a guy in the town council that wanted to pass something and he had tried every legal avenue and nothing worked. And he said, this is what I need to get done. Um, the woman that, the 19 year old that, that we had sexual relations with, she was what's called a breeder. She intentionally gets pregnant so that she can have an abortion. Because eventually, eventually I mean, you, a person can only have so many abortions before their body gives out and doesn't allow them to, to have any more babies. So her purpose is to have as many abortions as she can to get a higher status in the satanic coven. Hmm. Well, the lady, Oh, that's just unfortunate. So the spell, did it work? Yes. Okay, so the guy got his bill passed through. Right. And you had to get the blood on your hands for the magic to work. Right. Okay, so it sounds like you've been indoctrined, uh, you know, and I guess it's kind of hard to put words to what they're having you do. And you said your legs were kind of wobbly. You know, I mean, there, at there any time were you thinking, this is nuts, you know, I should run now? Well, you know, once again, snicker bars and potato chips and pizza. Okay. 
you know, and money whenever I want, and you know, I'm having sex as much as I want, and you know, I'm I'm not thinking that what I'm doing is necessarily wrong or bad. I mean, I heard my parents whisper the word abortion once, so I thought abortion was a dirty word, but I didn't know what it was, you know, and even when that happened, I mean, I remember asking my dad, I was probably 17 or 18 years old, and I asked my dad what was his stance on abortion. And he looked so shocked that I said the word. And I was kind of, internally, I thought it was funny because my dad was shocked by the word. You know, but then he said that he thinks he's against it, but he's not positive. It depends on why the woman would want it. You know, and I thought, okay, so it's a conditional thing. It's not wrong all the time. And you respect your father. I, I get that. All right, so that's all done with. You've had your first abortion. And right. we won't jump ahead, but you ended up with quite a few, and we'll get to that point. So what's next for Zachary King? Well, I just I kept doing magic. I did a, a few more abortions, like maybe four or five total, um, while I was in high school. And then I was graduating from high school and, you know, I was going off to college and, you know, this is before the internet. You know, I mean, you, you could find message boards, but a message board back then was not an internet place. It was, you'd go to like an adult bookstore and buy a magazine, a specialty magazine. And sometimes, I mean, there would be satanic magazines and they would have um, swingers ads in them and places where you could meet up with covens. But, you know, I, I didn't, I mean, those kind of places are kind of creepy and um, I just, I didn't want to meet a group of people like that. Do you consider yourself brainwashed to a point that you would even consider graduating from high school and going off to college and trying to find another coven? I'm having fun. It's still a good time for me. You know, I'm not considering, now looking back at myself, yes. But when you're in it, no. Well, the Lord does have a tendency to bless us with 20-20 vision for hindsight. Right, right. You know, and, you know, my concern was that I'm not going to find a satanic coven because they're not going to advertise it in the town square. You know, but then I found it because they advertised it in the town square. You know, I was just like, it, it was, you know, we, we, my school had the student union and there was um, the Baptist and the Catholic student union, the Republican, the Democrat, and the monarchy party student union. And we had the satanic student union. And he just said it like that. Come join the satanic student union. Yeah. I mean, there's like tables and chairs recruiting statements, uh, stations all over the student union, you know, and you just go up to whatever place you're interested in and talk to them, you know, read their brochures and go to one of their meetings. You know, and these are kids away from home for the first time with no adult supervision and think that the devil is all about taking drugs, getting drunk, and having sex. Do people well, come to the covens expecting to see, like, magic and let's say, supernatural events? I didn't know what to expect because, I mean, it's a satanic coven and they're established, but when I got there, it was, um, it was like a party setting. There was maybe 20 people there, and these people talked about being in a satanic coven, but they, like, made up magic spells on the spot. Um, they were practicing a lot of, like, hocus-pocus, not real magic, and um, talked about what they were doing, but they weren't doing anything nefarious. And for them, you know, they would go to the coven meeting on Saturday, and then on Sunday they'd go to church, regular Christian church. I mean, this, the, their coven meeting was more like um, a club. It was just right. tonight we're going to get drunk, and so they were there we're for the, the free booze and their cigarettes yeah. and drugs and whatnot. Right. Yeah, I 
been around children and when I chaperoned and I was kind of cautioned, they said, you know, when they come out with the monstrance and the blessed sacrament, be aware for certain types of, and I'm like, what? You know, I didn't really understand what they were talking about and nothing happened. They said, if you see something, this is the person you bring the attention to. They'll know what to do. Turns out, a year later when I didn't go, my son was there, and there was an attachment. And when the monstrance came down the aisle, the child, you know, reacted to it. And they knew what to do. They got him calmed down. It happened again later after they thought it was a, just a one-time occurrence. Mm -hmm. And someone saw and says, that's enough. I'm calling the person who could take care of it. Right. So I'm, I'm surprised that these people are in this coven with not getting attachments and they're going out to a Christian church. You know, I mean, you know, I, I could understand possibly, but I know the Catholic church, when you're near the real presence, Satan's not going to like that. Right, right. You know, and I, I went to a couple of these meetings and I thought, this isn't what I'm looking for. You know, like I had heard that there was a satanic coven out there that wanted to rule the world. You know, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to rule the world. I don't even know if that's real, but I want to know. I want to find out. You know, it, it was sort of like, when I was younger and I did the magic spell to see if magic was real. You know, if I'd have done the magic spell and it had not worked, I wouldn't have been. You'd have been an accountant by now. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't have been in this satanic coven. Oh I wouldn't my. have wasted my time. You know, and so I, I called my first coven and I said, you know what, I've heard that this coven exists. Where do I go? And so they gave me an address and they gave me a phone number. You know, and they said the name of the church, it's Satan's World Church or World Church of Satan. I was like, really? That's legitimately the name of it. Okay, all right. So I went to this place, and it's a warehouse about the size of a Super Walmart. Except back then, I don't think Super Walmart existed. And, you know, I went into this place. It's like 15,000 people, just wall-to-wall -wall people having a massive party. And, you know, let's go back to me being 13 at a sleepover. One night I woke up to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, and I saw this guy in a tuxedo. So he's wearing a, a black tuxedo, and he's got a, um, a wand and a top hat and corpse paint on his face. He looks like a member of KISS wearing a tuxedo. And I thought, that is the coolest look ever. I don't know who that is, but... So the next day I was like, Hey, I saw this guy last night. What is that? And they were like, you're dreaming. You didn't see that. Oh, all right. So this is adults lying to me. One day I'm going to find out what that is. I'll just store that away in the back of my head somewhere. So one day happened when I was 18 and I was at this party. And I saw not the same guy, but the same look. And I just think, I want to do that. Whatever that is, I want to do that. And I grabbed somebody close to me. I said, who is that? What is that? How can I do that? And they said, well, what was your coven like? Like, who was in charge? And so we had a really big satanic coven. It had 120 to 150 members. Um, you know, we had 13 high priests and priestesses. Yeah. And, and they said, okay, well, we are run by a CEO and a board of directors. I go, what? Well, we have, you know, a chief executive officer. I'm like, yeah, I got that, CEO. And I'm like, and a board of directors. Like, the CEO can't make a decision without the board of directors approving it. But also, the board of directors can't make a decision without the CEO joining in on that. I was like, okay, that seems like a lot of work. You know, and he said, well, it, it is it system of checks and balances. Everything's equal like that. Okay. I said, and what about the guy, the, the rock star? They said, that's the high wizard. I never heard of a high wizard. And the high wizard does the official magic of the coven. Well, that position I recognize because I wore the red robe. And that's the same position to me. 
So, so was he just visiting the guy you saw when you were a child? He was visiting my coven. Mm -hmm. um, my coven had been an OTO coven, so it was Ordi Templis Orianti, which is probably the second largest satanic coven in the world. Um, mine was just a, um, a subsidiary branch of that, so it was an OTO coven and it was a Diablo Sex coven. Um, covens that embrace the name Diablo Sex are involved in child prostitution, child pornography, and human trafficking. And it all sounds terrible. <laughs> it is. And my second coven was also a Diablo Sex coven. But there are covens that just identify strictly as Diablo Sex. You know, so I, the, the second coven is also a Diablo Sex coven, so I thought I would feel at ease there because mm -hmm. they're doing the same thing that my first coven did. And, you know, I, I'm really wanting to be the high wizard, and I don't know how to get that. They, the guy said that it's rumored that the devil handpicks the high wizard. Okay, so all I gotta do is get the devil's attention. I don't know quite how to do that, but I'm thinking more abortions? That seems like the way to go. Mm. Abortions would be the way to get the devil's attention. So I started putting the feelers out there that I've done assisted abortions before and I'm more than willing to participate in whatever you guys want me to do. Like, I, I can do magic. I've been doing magic since I was 10 years old. You know, now I'm 18, so I've been doing magic for eight years, and I've participated in abortions. I started when I was 14, and I've done like four or five of them. And whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do this. So I did this for a few years. When I turned 21, I got a letter in the mail that summoned me before the CEO and the board of directors. But everybody that I ever heard that that, that can't happened be good. to, right, everybody that ever that happens to, they're never heard from again. Wow. So I'm not thinking I'm being chosen to be the high wizard. I'm thinking I did something wrong or stupid. This will be a good place to pause. Folks, this is Zachary King. We're talking about his conversion story from Christianity to Satanism, and that's why I want to tease that. We'll find out if he gets his job as the High Wizard, which, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is like our Catholic Pope to a to a point. It's the highest level. It, you're more like a cardinal because okay, because there's more than one. Right, there's more than one, Good and analogy. a and a cardinal can move up to be the Pope. The, sure. the High Wizard can't move up beyond okay. the high wizard. We'll hold that thought. We've got a few more questions for Zach, and we'll hear the rest of his story, and we'll be right back. This is SJEN-TV. And we're back. This is SJEN-TV. My name is Matt Logman, and today I am talking with Zachary King. Interesting story, I'm sure you believe so already, as we're talking about this man who was manipulated and, and taken advantage of by a, a satanic cult, but he embraced it because you couldn't tell him anything at the time. And as we left on break, you had just got the call for the position that you've been like earning for. What happened? Well, I went out and I bought a handgun and a bunch of ammo because I thought these guys are going to kill me. I didn't know what I had done, but I didn't know I was being summoned to be the high wizard. And I wasn't going to just die just like that. And I walked in there holding a, a six hour in my lower back with uh, like a hundred rounds of ammo on me. And um, instead they handed me um, a very hokey handbook that said the high wizard handbook. And they showed me nine versions of a costume that was basically a tuxedo with a top hat and a wand or a cane and corpse paint on my face and um, said that I could customize my own look and when you open up the, the handbook the first thing it says no one can tell you what to do. Awesome! That's what I want. This is the position I've lived for. You know, no one can tell me what to do. Now what that means is that 
somebody's going to come to my coven and look at hiring me to do magic. And once they pay the money, it's up to me to say yes or no. You know, although, you know, I kind of felt like if you're willing to pay big money, you get a spell. And did you ever say no to a spell? Once. 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 All right. Must have been really bad. Come on. Um, the one spell that I turned down, and I didn't know all the details, um, it was the, the murdering of a pope. And they wanted me to do a spell that would clear the road so that something could happen to a pope. And I grew up Baptist. I don't really know anything about the Catholic Church. But of the things that I do know, <laughs> you don't mess with a pope. Well, I'm glad you said no, that you brought <laughs> that up. I, I was like, you know, they want me to do something to a pope, and I'm like, mm-mm, no. So what did they say when you said no? Well, go find another wizard? What? Well, yeah, there's between two and five of us in the world. In the world. And the number could be as low as one or as high as ten, which is a, an ego trip and uh -huh. a half. But, you know, whatever you say, I mean, if you say no, the answer is no. And, yeah, then they'll just go talk to somebody else. But, uh, you know, I don't know anything about the Pope at this point. I remember I own the comic book, the, the, the comic book on Pope John Paul II. I owned that as a kid. I thought that was a cool, a cool comic book. I thought he was a cool Pope, but I didn't know anything about him. And so when they're saying they want me to do this magic spell and it's to, to clear the path to, to murder a Pope, nope. I didn't, even, I didn't even have to think about it. It's like, no. In hindsight, was this when the attempted assassination happened? Was no. Seen? Okay. Just wanted to clear that out. No, but um, yeah, I was like, I don't know. I, I just, even looking back, I was like, man, I wasn't stupid. You know, all the things that I did do that I was stupid about, wasn't stupid about the Catholic Church. You know, I was like, hmm. All right, so you haven't witnessed or seen the error of your ways yet. You're living right. this rock star mentality right. life. You're working spells. You're seeing people be possessed. Right. And, and I'm seeing, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing things that, you know, this is before the Internet for a lot of these things. So I, I don't realize that, you know, that there's a place called Bohemian Grove out in California. I get to go there. I, I find out that the, there's an organization called the Illuminati, you know, and I get to work for them. I help rock stars sell their souls through the Illuminati, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, this is such an easy job. You know, there's so much stuff to do, but, I mean, I get to meet rock stars. I get to party with rock stars. I get to, I'm meeting actors. You know, and everybody that meets me, they meet me. I'm in the costume. You know, so they don't really know who I am. You know, I'm meeting billionaires. I'm meeting kings and queens and monarchs and presidents. And, and I get to travel everywhere. But, you know... Without a passport. So how does that some, happen? Sometimes without a passport. I eventually did have to have a passport. But, um, you know, after 9-11 happened, you know, then, then I had to, I had to get, give myself a passport. But um, prior to that, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was like when I first got it, and I, and, and I equate it many times to working in a candy store. You know, and not just a, a, a candy store in the mall but like a freestanding building where you're looking at tens of thousands of pieces of candy and you're wondering how long is it going to take you to try every piece of candy? Now, not the licorice because nobody wants that, but the regular candy. And, and that is the sins. How many sins are there in the world? Not every sin because some sin is disgusting. You don't want to do every sin. But the sins you want to do, how long does that take? Well, after six months, you've tried all your favorite candy at least once. And after a year, you've tried the candy you swore you'd never try. So after a year, you've done the sins that you swore you'd never do. But, you know, when you can sin all you want, sins get boring after a while. You know, so, but then, you know, when you first start working there, there's these red tiles on the walls and the floor that are beautiful and bright and cheerful and make you happy when you look at them. But after a while, they're dull, listless. 
you can never get them as clean as they did that first day on the job. You know, so that's kind of like, you know, that's not as exciting as it used to be. So where's your family during all this time? They think you're out there at college and have a new job? Is there a girlfriend involved? Or I guess you didn't, um, I don't want to get into your personal life, but. There's um, multiple girlfriends at this time. Um, you know, my, my parents, I had a, my brother was special needs and he required much of my parents' attention. So, and my brother would never tell on me no matter what. I could do anything and my brother could have caught me doing it and he wouldn't tell. And, you know, which was to me a plus. You know, hey, my brother's not telling, that's great. And, um, you know, my parents kind of suspected that I was up to no good, but they didn't catch me. And my dad is really big on, you know, you've got to catch somebody doing something wrong for them to be doing something wrong. And if you're not catching them, then maybe... They're really good or they're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and I'm sure he suspected the whole time that I was up to no good. So it would be hard to hide all that money and, and monetary goods, although they, they, you were not lacking growing up. Right. All right. So, I, so go ahead. So, um, you know, I'm getting to, I'm, I'm getting to, I get to travel. I get to meet rock stars. I get to do all this stuff that's fun, but after a while, you have to travel. You have to sin because it's expected of you. You have to meet these people. You have to do magic spells for them. You know, I, I don't want to, to do this stuff, but, you know, let's go back to, uh, there's three ways to escape. I can kill myself, I can be murdered, or I can die of natural causes, and all three of those methods, I end up in hell. You know, I don't want to die. I don't want, I mean, you know, when I was a kid and I signed my soul away, it was, you know, super cool. I'm going to die when I'm 90 years old and I've got time to change my mind and, you know, and all of that. But at some point you're like, wait, I don't actually know when I'm going to die. You know, I'm not 10 foot tall and bulletproof like I I would think that it would be like the mafia when you try to leave. No, you're not going to leave. Right, right. And, And anytime you think about getting out, somebody stops by your house and drops a hint that they know what you're thinking about. Paranoia you know, I'm not telling anybody. kicks in. Right, paranoia kicks in. You know, and you're being watched all the time. There's always somebody coming by your house. Even as a high wizard. Even as a high wizard. So they're watching especially your back. The high wizard. They're watching everything you do. You know, and you have to write reports on stuff that you're doing, your magic stuff, everything has a report and you know, you start thinking, okay, I've got two bank accounts. One has $85 million in it, and one of them has $12 million. Now, the bank account, the bank account that's really mine has $265 in it. But you have access to the other ones. I have access, but everybody watches if any money comes out. Like, there's, there's accounts that, that, are, that my bills go to, mm-hmm. but my real bills... I've had times when I've bounced checks and I'm not I'm worth negative money. You know, because my account has two hundred and sixty five dollars. So even though your name's on it, it's the right. Coven's account. Right, it's the Coven's account. I have a house. I, I have I have a house at one time when I lived in Tallahassee, Florida, I lived in an area of town called Frenchtown. It, it's the ghetto. It, it's it's like I'm the closest They wouldn't let you stay in your house? Well, because the house that I live in and Tallahassee is not a cover town. Tallahassee is where I really live. So that's my real place. But if you went to Atlanta, I have a condo. If you went to Manhattan, I lived in a high rise. If you went to California, I have a place in Calabasas. I have a nice mansion. All so being if paid you go for to, by the coven. Yeah, all of these places play, paid for by the coven. And this is where, like, Satan's all about using your illusion. You know, if you see me at one of those places, I'm wearing an Armani suit. If you see me at my house, I'm wearing cut-off jeans and a metallic shirt because that's my real clothes. You know, I, I have a, a garage in Calabasas that has 12 cars in it, and they're all nice. They're all super nice and fast and, you know, and all of that. But my real car is a Nissan Sentra, and it's not even a new Nissan Sentra. It's older. 
you know, and it's got so dents. Why in it, so. would they let you drive a Nissan Sentra when all these cars are there? Because that's my real car. Right. I don't have the persona. Could they give you a new real car? <laughs> they could, but but uh, there's no fun in that for them. Um, so you know, it's a, it, it's a business. It, it is like a business. And in, they're using in you. in Tallahassee. Right, I'm being used in um, in Tallahassee. That's where the real me lives. That's where I'm not putting on airs. I'm not acting like I'm something that I'm not. But in these other places, it's all about everybody wants to be the high wizard, and this is what the high wizard has. He has these cars and that house. And Funneling money into the coven and Satan's church. But I would think that they're going to throw you a bone so you don't bounce a check. Well, I, I get gifts sometimes. I get... Um, I had at one time, I had the Conan the Barbarian pinball machine, which if you've ever seen it, the pinball, the ball itself is the size of a bowling ball. And the rest of the game is equally that large. Um, I have not seen it. It, it's, it was a wonderful pinball machine. Right. And, you know, I had video games and I had, um, I had my regular car. And then sometimes one of the places I did a spell for, they gave me a Land Rover. You know, it was very nice to have it, but um, I couldn't really afford it because the insurance on a Land Rover was kind of expensive. Yeah, that's just amazing that all that money's there and they let you, but then that's Satan. <laughs> right. Okay, right. I get it. So it sounds like you've done all the sins, eaten all the candy, and right. you're getting tired, uh, you know, maybe if you're looking for a change of scenery, but right. you don't know how to get out. Right. So I decide that I'm going to pilfer a little money, even out of my own account. I'm just that's a sin. <laughs> Sorry. I just I just want I, I have to like take it out a little bit per month. Embezzling for, your own account for, as for a, a Satanist few, for a few months. Zachary, you're killing me. And <laughs> no spells though. I, I, I just need um, I, I need to take out like twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. It's my own money. But I can't just take it all out at once because they'd be like, what's he doing with that? You know, it, it's got to be like, I'm going to take 20 bucks out here, 40 yeah. bucks there. Eventually, I have a, a, a nice little amount of money. And I make a doctor's appointment at a satanic doctor because everybody we know is a satanist. And I make an appointment and I drive that way. I'm on the interstate. So now, if they're looking at you... He's going to the doctor. I'm going to the doctor. I understand it now because I heard you and say this before in a talk, and I'm like, I don't get it yet. And the doctor's appointment is at 5 p.m. It's the last appointment of the day. So I'm going to get on the interstate, and I'm going to head that way. But instead of getting off where I'm supposed to, I kept going. And I drove out of town, and I drove till I ran out of gas. I can't believe it. I mean, you must have been so paranoid looking in the rear, rear mirror. And, I was. You know, Good grief. And you're, I, trying, you're running for your life. Right. And, um, you know, I drove till I ran out of gas. I spent the night in my car. And the next day, I hitchhiked to the next town. I sold my car for scrap and I bought a Greyhound bus ticket. And I tried to go into Canada and I got rejected at the border. And so they told me I could go anywhere in the United States that Greyhound goes. And I kind of um, opened up. Uh, United States Atlas, closed my eyes and just put my finger down, I landed on Oklahoma, and I was like, okay, going to Oklahoma. And uh, I went there, I lived off the grid for almost three years, and then I bought another car. How did you survive off the grid? Just odd jobs? Odd jobs, yeah. What were you doing for your I, party I mean, money? I mean, because I, you, I mean, you got probably many addictions. Um, at that point, um, Marijuana, cocaine, and booze were my favorite drugs of choice. And they're not free. They're not free. So um, I guess you were living a life of crime to make ends meet, maybe. Um, I, was, I, I was a bouncer in a few of the bars there. Oh, yeah? And then I also got a job working at, at one time, Walmart, and another time, Kmart. So there was no I-9, so you were able to use an alias? Yeah. yeah so I, since you, to, I, I changed my name when I got to Oklahoma. Since you flew the coop. I mean, were you concerned about, because you always hear stories, you leave and we've got your family. Well, I didn't have, I mean, I had given up on my family years before. I stopped contacting them. I didn't want my parents drug into any of this. Wow. 
and you know, I made sure that there was nothing traceable to my parents. And how old are you now at this time? At that time, Off I, the was, grid. I was about 33 years old. And you were a high wizard for how long? So we can kind of keep our years. numbers together. 12 years as a high wizard. So 21 to 33. I would imagine 12 years as a high wizard, you could it's write a, a book. It's a lifetime. Folks, it's this book is by Zachary King. It's called Abortion is a Satanic Sacrifice. You probably won't get no arguments out of the pro-lifers that I know. <laughs> but the fact that Zachary knows it's a satanic sacrifice, in a nutshell. I mean, people will either believe you or he's making it up. How can we tell the people that it's a satanic, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe, but not all of them, but or, I mean, I've heard you make reference before that there's probably one coven member at every, you know, place every, that they every, do these. Every abortion clinic usually has at least one coven member. And they can deny that. I oh, mean, sure. But, you know, I know from going into them that it's true. They would invite you to come in to get blood, to have a good, powerful spell, and then just move along. Right. That's just amazing. And the women had no idea that they were being used as a devilish spell? Some of them did. Some of them did? <laughs> well, all right, so... You realized, I guess, maybe the error of your ways yet. I mean, obviously, you're running. I'm, um, <clears throat> yeah. And then Folks, this has a good ending, trust me. <laughs> I, um, I bought a car, and I tried to make it into Canada again. I got rejected again at the border. No passport. And, and no passport. And a friend told me that there was a crossing near Vermont where there was no border guard. But you're in Oklahoma, so that's a long drive. It was. And um, I, I tried to, uh, I had gone from Oklahoma to um, Maine, and I was going to go to, I think it's called Prince, Prince Edward Island. I had met a friend there, and so I was going to escape and go there, and then I couldn't. I got rejected, so I was heading back across the United States. So you still have all your powers, able to do spells. Right. So you're still in with the devil. Right. Okay. I, I'm, I don't belong to an official satanic coven, but I'm still doing all the magic still. Gotcha. I, I don't do abortions anymore, but I'm still doing all the magic because I'm addicted. You know, I, I, I still love doing it. And um, so I drive to this, this border crossing near Vermont, and on the way there, I'm just a couple of hours away. I am so sleepy. I've got to pull over and take a nap. So I do that. I pull over at a, at a rest stop, and I take a nap. And when I wake up, it's the next day. Like, I didn't think I was tired enough to sleep the entire night. I thought I was just going to sleep for like an hour or two. A little divine intervention, maybe? Possibly. When I woke up, and I, I'm like, well, it's the next day. What difference does it make? I'll just drive across now. So I drove a couple of hours and I get there and I'm, I'm driving across the border and this border guard pulls me over. And you know, I'm like, what? There's not supposed to be anybody here. And I pull my car over and I get out of the car and he tells me that he's gonna have to search my car inside and out, top to bottom. I'm like, okay, whatever. And there's no border, there's no station there. There's nothing. There's no place and to go. And you had contraband or anything in your car? What no. you worried about? Okay. No. But, so um, Barney Five does his thing. Barney Five does his thing. He's really nice, really nice man. And he tells me how that to, he's been trying to get this job for three years, and this is his very first day on the job. And you had to sleep 16 hours so this guy could stop you. How does that play right. into God's plan here? I'm thinking God's got a sense of humor. That we know that. If I would have driven across the border yesterday, Scott -free. I'd be in Canada now. And, uh, but instead, here we are. So I get rejected at the border. And Turned I'm worth, you around. And yep, I'm worth $18 and I've got half a oh tank boy. of gas. So I drive to Burlington, Vermont, and I get a job my first day in town as a dishwasher at a place called Nectar's. And then I ended up being head of security there. And then 
I ended up getting another job as um, head of security at another club. Still was, under your alias names? Yeah. And, and I got a job as the GM. And then from there, I started, I went into retail. And I was always a manager at a retail store. And I eventually got a job at a place called Piercing Pagoda. And one night I did a magic spell. The next day I went to work. And, you know, I was the manager at Piercing Pagoda. And this woman came up and she wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings. And I present her with the perfect pair. And then she says, well, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. And when I'm done, I'll come back and I'll make the purchase. Everybody that says that means I'm going to go find it cheaper someplace else. But she had an honest face. I knew she was really coming back. And sure enough, in three hours, she comes back. We do the transaction, and at the end of the, the deal, I said, if you call the 800 number on this receipt and take a survey, you might win $1,000. And I was, I was really happy dealing with her. She was uh, just a fantastic personality, a lovely lady. And she said, I've got something for you, too. <laughs> Probably no. thinking Watchtower no. pamphlets. I was actually thinking Jack Chick pamphlet. I thought she's going to be one of these evangelical types and you know, tell me I'm sinning and I need to drop to my knees and beg for forgiveness. And Luckily, she didn't do the evil spirit come out. I'm <laughs> just saying. You know, everything that, oh boy. that I was expecting her to do, you know, I was like, oh, man. Because I've had evangelical types follow me home to evangelize to me. You know, and I'm like, okay, so I'll just swear I'm going to be like the devil. I'm going to be 99% truth and 1% lie. I'm going to swear I'm going to read this pamphlet. I'm going to read the cover, and then I'm going to throw it in the trash. And instead, she pulls out a little gold-colored piece of tin, very cheap. Now, I work at Piercing Pagoda. I recognize cheap jewelry because we sell cheap jewelry. And um, I know that this is a gold-colored piece of tin. I don't know what it is. It's a miraculous metal, but I don't know that at the time. We sold miraculous metals, but I didn't know what they were. They weren't titled. You know, they didn't have names on them. They had like an MM on them. I don't know what sure, that means. Sure. And um, she pulls this thing out, and she says the weirdest thing I've ever heard. You know, I partied with rock stars. You know, you put unlimited booze and drugs into somebody that can write a song, and they'll say some weird stuff. You know, and she said... The Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. I grew up Baptist. Oh, you don't know that song? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I grew up Baptist. Um, we've got the name Mary. We don't have any titles. I, I don't know who the Blessed Mother is. I'm thinking Isis, Gaia. I have no clue. And then she says it's really powerful. Well, Christians don't bless anything. So this woman represents some female deity cult, clearly. That probably got your interest, though, didn't it? Well, it did in some ways, but, you know, in other ways, I was thinking, you know, I came from two big cults. I'm not interested in yours. I'm not looking at becoming another high wizard of another coven. I, I, so you many had covens, magic. So many covens are connected. Mm -hmm. I can't afford to join a coven and then find out they're connected to Satan's world church. Right, right. They, they'll find you. And, and then they'll find me. Yeah, I don't want this to happen. Did you change your look or anything? No, I had, um, I, well, I did, I had a, a dreadlock. Uh, I had long hair, but I had long hair before. Um, I grew a beard and sometimes uh, uh, a mustache or a goatee. Because right. when you're a high wizard, you don't have any face paint. Because of the paint. paint. You, you don't have any face hair because of the face paint. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, to, I'm dressed pretty nice as a manager. And, um, so you're so supposed I'm to thinking, join the army, okay? Yeah, but, but I'm thinking, how is it that the crazy people always find me? Like, here it is, she's talking on and on and on about all this stuff that I need to do. I'm not even paying attention. I'm just like, I got to do something to change the way I look or the way I act. Something about how I look must say that I need saving. The doctor is in. And, and, and I need... I need to do something different. And, um, you know, she, she says again it's really powerful. And now I'm taking that as a challenge. Like, no, 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 I'm the high wizard. You know, Now, for the people I that I, I want to, what was your percent 
you had a percent, there was a number to it, of success with was, your magic. I was 91% accurate. 91% accurate for Satan. Now, to get that percentage, your magic spells have to take place within 90 days. Anything that takes lo longer than 90 days, you don't get credit for. Okay. Unless it's a spell that's supposed to take place in five years. And then if it's a time spell, you get automatic credit because it's not fair that that credit, that goes against you. Because it's, okay. you know, you're 91% accurate now, most likely that's going to come true. Okay, so we've got the blessed metal. You don't know what it is. She's I don't talking know what it on is. and on because I, I want to make sure that we get this in. And then we got to talk about what you learned about the rosary. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I'm thinking I, I don't, I don't want to take this thing, whatever it is, but when she challenged me with it's very powerful, there's no way. I, I could have been the one high wizard out of seven billion people in the world. There's no way that that little worthless gold-colored piece of tin can touch me. And I stuck my hand out. And she was all giddy because, oh my gosh, you know, he's, gonna, he's willing to take the metal. And she drops it in my hand and I clench my fist around it. My plan is, because I could feel anything used in a magic spell, and I could tell you that was used in a protection spell. That was used in a death spell. Your friend found this at a garage sale and made up a story about it. You know, and I know I'm going to feel nothing. And I'm going to toss it on the floor, slam it on my counter, and tell her it's worthless. And if she wants to return the gold and get her money back, that's fine. And if she wants to call my boss and complain, my boss will never believe that I had bad customer service because I make my days, my weeks, my months, my quarters, and my year. So, you know, do whatever you want to do. But I'm going to tell her this is worthless. And she drops it in my hand and I clench my fist, all ready to tell her this stuff, except that when I clench my fist, my store and my mall completely disappeared. But yeah. you're still conscious. I'm still conscious, but everything's gone. I'm standing in a darkened void. It's me and the woman that gave me the medal, and she tells me about the magic spell I did the night before and says, and that's of the devil. And she tells me about the 100 plus assisted abortions I've done, and that's of the devil. And the 100 plus Baptist churches I helped split around the world, and that's of the devil. And she does about 10 more sins that nobody knows I did in this town, and she ends everything with, and that's of the devil. Very similar to the Lord with the woman at the well. He tells her her life story. And she's like, how does he know this? And I'm terrified. And let's go back yeah. to, I could have been the one high wizard out of seven billion people. I don't have the magic to transport two people to a darkened void and know all of one of them sins. Yeah, levitation, that's that. nothing, man. This is good stuff here, right? Her magic is stronger than mine. I don't know what to do. I want to let go. Wow. But what happens if I let go and I fall through this darkened void? What happens if I don't find my way back to my store? I don't know what to do. I'm sweating. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. But this time when she said that, I knew that was the Mother of God. And when I knew it was the Mother of God, Mary showed up. And she smiled but at me. the same lady, just like transformed or? No, it was Mary. It was the Blessed Mother. That was the up. lady that was talking to you the whole time in disguise? I'm just no, to... no, that woman, that was Mary Ann Wickman. Okay. That was the, the woman so you that know gave her. me the medal. Right. Um, but the Blessed Mother showed up. The Blessed Mother showed up. And this is like the prettiest woman I've ever seen in my life. And she smiled at me. And I knew I did not deserve that smile. I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions. And it, it was just the, the most incredible, incredible happening. And she takes me by the hand that has the metal in it, and she turns me around. And Divine Mercy Jesus is standing behind me. And I've got these rays of light going around me and under me and through me. I don't know what divine mercy is. I don't know what these rays of light mean. Did you know that this was Christ? 
I mean, for I, some, I, okay, yeah, you I, were I knew it was Baptist Jesus. at one time. Yeah, I knew it was Jesus, but I didn't know what divine mercy Jesus right. was. You know, and, and I knew instantly that I did not sell my soul to the devil when I was 13. You know, I knew that mm -hmm. all my new age and Satanism and occultism and magic was fake. You know, and I knew that everything Catholic was truth. Well, I think your next book ought to be called From Saul to Paul. This is great, Zachary. I mean, I'm finally glad for the listeners as well that we are getting to the point where God's love, because, you know, everybody likes to hear about God's love, and, and just right. it's, it's, it's inspiring. And All right. the, the Blessed Mother told me my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my hand, and I was back in my store. This woman is still talking to me. She tells me... Did you like, do one of these, you know, like looking around? What happened here? And she tells me where she goes to Mass, and gives me the address, and she told me that she was Father Joseph Whalen's personal assistant in the St. Raphael Healing Oil Ministry. And I, don't, I have no idea who these people are. And while she's talking to me, her cell phone rings. And she looks at it and she goes, oh, this is Father Joe, I've got to take this call. I was like, well, you just said he's the busiest priest you met, you know, and all that. Go ahead and take the call. And so at that time, Father Joe was going deaf, and he talked like everybody was going deaf. And she takes the phone call. She's like, Father Joe, what can I do for you? Can you hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? You know, and she's like, oh, here and you go. you can hear this, right? I can hear this. She hands me the phone, and I'm shaking like Ozzy Osbourne. You know, I'm like, hello? Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. So, yeah, thank you, Father. And then we got like two more phone calls like that. Then her daughter comes up to the counter and she says, would you bring this man one of each of everything? And her daughter disappears and she comes back and one of each of everything, you know, there's like, I don't know, 200 Lighthouse Catholic media discs and uh, pamphlets, why do Catholics do this or believe that? And I got a Catholic Bible. And, um, and then the next day I went to daily mass for the first time. I took a friend with me, and at the consecration, I saw Jesus. I thought everybody in the room saw the same thing. I thought, wow, this is like the best kept secret for me ever. You know, like, and I turned to my friend, and I said, you see that? She said, what? I said, that guy up there. She goes, what guy? I said, the guy on the stage. She goes, that's the priest. I said, no, the other the stage, guy. stage, I like that, for the altar, I like it. I said, the other guy. And she says, I, I don't see another guy. I said, you don't see it because you're not Catholic. Because I thought everybody in the room was Catholic. Everybody could see Jesus at the consecration. It, it was still a few days before I found out that I was the only one seeing this stuff. You know, and then finding out that there was a place called Perpetual Adoration where I could go and, and, and see Jesus any time. And, and I was like, is there like a sign-up sheet for that? Do I have to like add my name to a list and then eventually they'll call me? when it's my turn to go, you know, and she's like, no, you just go any time. You know, which didn't make any sense to me. There's a line to get in to see Elvis and he's been dead for 40 years. So, you know, I, I go and shock number one, our car was the only other car in the parking lot. You know, shock number two, oh, there's, yeah. no, there's no line to get in. Shock number three, we enter the, the chapel and it's me and my assistant and Jesus and, it is the and, best kept secret, isn't and, it? And this woman, yeah. And, <laughs> it's... and this woman looks up like a deer in the headlights and packs her stuff as fast as she could go. Her hour's and, up. <laughs> I mean, if, if this was an Olympic event, she got gold. And then she just announced, you can't leave till someone else comes in. And bam, she's out the door. You know, and I'm thinking, why would I leave? I'm in a room with God. You know, that became my normal hangout anywhere from 1 to 18 hours a day. So this um, led you into RCIA. Yes. Because obviously they're taking care of you. Right. And the it, power it, is amazing. The, the, they got me a spiritual director. Uh, my first director was Father Anthony Gramlich. He's the rector for the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And he said I at least needed a deliverance and I might need an exorcism. So I went back to Monsignor and that was the priest that was bringing me into the church. And I told him this is what Father Anthony says. And he said, well, one thing, he goes, you're sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament for 18 hours a day. There's no demon willing to do that. Right. He goes, and second of all, he said, at your conversion, Mary and Jesus showed up. 
He was that scared the hell out of anything that was with you. He said, so he did, he did a deliverance on me, but I didn't get a, an exorcism. And, um, and I had satanic gifts that I didn't know that I had, and they left when I got my deliverance. I no longer had them. And this happened in January of 08. I officially entered the Catholic Church in May of 08, and I worked a little bit with St. Raphael for a couple of years. And then the Blessed Mother told me I had to start my own ministry and, you know, come up with a cool name. So it's like, okay. So I, I had taken Benedict as my confirmation name, my saint. And uh, so I really like St. Benedict, but I really like Padre Pio as well. He's a rock star. And, uh, and then I really like Blessed Bartolo Longo. And, um, you know, and then I, I had a true devotion to the Blessed Mother. You know, but I'm thinking the St. Benedict, Padre Pio, Blessed Botolo, Longo, Blessed Mother ministry doesn't roll off the tongue. And then I started thinking about, well, we're all about inclusion in this country, so I should do All Saints Catholic ministry. So I started that in 2010, and um, it's been a wild ride so far, but definitely working for God is so much better than working for the devil. Oh, well, amen, brother. So I would have to guess from some of the things I've heard and just assuming that you would be still using an alias because you don't want the bad guys to... Uh... Right. All right. Because I remember I saw a jihadist that had converted to Christianity. And he had a bodyguard with him all the time. You know, nobody said it was a bodyguard, but when I saw him talk at the church, I'm like, "That guy's armed, man. I know he's <laughs> armed." You know, I mean, my dad was an FBI, so you know. All right, so you converted to Catholicism. Did you tell your parents? I did tell my parents when I converted to Catholicism, and I really thought that they would disown me because my my mother had converted from she had grown up Catholic. And she converted to being Baptist so she could marry my dad. And then my dad, when I was a little kid, when I was um, between first and third grade, my dad would give me a ride to school and I would walk home. And both ways I passed a Catholic church. I never knew what this building was. I mean, I knew it's got stained glass windows, same as my Baptist church. And they've got a crucifix, we've got a cross. I didn't know the difference. And they've got this big bell that you hear ring X number of times a day. And every once in a while, I mean, at, at the Baptist church, the preacher wore a suit and his wife wore a flowery dress. Well, outside these places, there's like a man wearing a, a black shirt and, and a black jacket sometimes and black No tuxedo. <laughs> and, and sometimes it looked like he was wearing foot pajamas. I don't know what those, that was about. And then these women were dressed in blue, brown, or black dress that went from the top of their head down to the ground, couldn't tell which woman was married to what man. And uh, one day I was walking past and there was this nun out there, I didn't know there were priests and nuns, but this nun out there looked like love. If you looked up the word love in the dictionary, her picture would have been there. And I ran up to give her a hug and she bent down, she knelt down and she gave me a hug back. It was a really long hug. And then after a while, I looked up and saw my friends way off in the distance. So I ran off to be with them. But the next day, when my dad's giving me a ride past, I got to know what this building is. Like, I've got a burning desire. Yeah, I was like, Dad, 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 what's that? <sighs> it's the Catholics. I'm eight years old. I can read the sign. It says Catholic Church. What's a Catholic? It doesn't matter. They're all going to hell. So that's the knowledge I had about right. the Catholic Church my entire life, is that one day I was going to go to hell and I would see all the Catholics there. So you might as well just sell your soul to the devil, make it official. Yeah, you know, just I'll beat you there. All right. So explain to the people that you have 146 assisted suicides, I'm sorry, assisted abortions, but you tried 103 extra ones. I, I did. I tried 149. 149. So three fails. Right. And I thought it was interesting that you said even high wizards have paperwork. Right. And you guys keep records and, and this yeah. and that. And, well, anybody would want, how, what did I do wrong? So you got all the paperwork, and there was one common denominator there. 
Yeah, it had to I, have baffled you because you were the man. Right. Um, and 146 is not even close to the, the most abortions done by a high wizard. But everything, I mean, I'm 91% accurate and three of my abortions failed. And at one of my abortions, uh, most of our abortions happen, if they're going to happen in an actual clinic, they happen after hours. My three failed ones happened during the day. So during regular business hours. And I go into this place and I have an entourage with me. We're going to do a magic spell. And the woman's there. She's a breeder. She knows why she's there. You know, she's given up her baby to, you know, for, for this abortion. And um, I'm standing up there with my handler. My handler is who brings me my sins, basically. And we're standing there. There's these large jealousy windows with a huge crank. And everybody's ready for the abortion, but I'm looking out across the street. We have a satanic biker gang on our side of the street, and they're flicking cigarettes over on the other side, and there's people standing over there just being silent and using um, prayer beads, prayer ropes, worry beads. And these are all the things that I called them. I didn't know what they were. And at one point, they all these people across the street drop down to their knees, and they pull out these worry beads and you know just to go into town on them you know one bead after another and we can hear them but we can't make out what they're saying so I use the jealousy crank and crank the window open so I can hear what they're saying and I repeat back what I'm hearing and I, I'd never heard anything Catholic so I'm listening to Hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus none of that made any sense to me and then my handler said the other part, Holy Mary, Mother of God, and we burst out laughing because who can be the Mother of God? And then we repeated it a couple more times and then I closed the window. And I went over, it's time to do the abortion. And as we're getting ready to do everything and my mask is on, my gloves are on, I've got my high wizard costume on, and the doctor says, wait, you're not even dilated. This is a waste of time. Why are we here? Like, perhaps we can come back tomorrow. You know, and I said, not me. I got other stuff to do tomorrow, so I'm out of here. And the woman starts cussing both of us out that we're stupid. You know, the baby's in the birth canal. It's time to go. You know, it's time to rock and roll. You know, and she tells me, is this your first rodeo too? Doesn't sound like her first rodeo. No, not hers. You know, and she asked me if it's mine, and I was like, no. She goes, we need to check because I'm dilated. And I said, I'm not a doctor. I, don't, I couldn't tell you if you're dilated or not. And the doctor's like, she's not. Trust me. And so, you know, she tells me, you need to get down there and get to business. You know, and I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not the doctor. I'm, I'm not the guy that does this. You know, and she's yelling at him some more. I ask him, are you sure? Can you check one more time? He checks again. She says, she's not dilated. We talk for like another 20 seconds and we hear a baby cry. And we both look down and the baby came out. Well, out of the womb murder. We're not going to kill the baby at this point. The baby came out, so it's going to be um, a social worker, uh, a nurse, and a, um, an attorney that comes in and gets the baby adopted to a regular family. And there's people that want these babies. And it's a non-Satanist. And now we're done. You know, we walk out. Now I've got to do more paperwork. More divine intervention. I've got to do more paperwork because I've got a failed abortion. But then this time, this was my third one. And so when I got back to the office, I said, I need you to pull all the high wizard reports on failed abortions. So I want to read them all. I want to see what's the common denominator. But reading them all, Every report said something about there being people there that were protesting and that, and, and that was a common denominator, but none of those people belonged to the same, it didn't say that they belonged to the same church or the same organization. Some of them didn't even belong to church. Oh, we come from all over. And, and that there were people praying um, Jesus beads, Jesus rope, um, Worry beads, 
uh, all kind of different titles, but nobody called it a rosary. And, You're learning something new every day. And it wasn't until, like, I've, I've been, you know, on this side of things, and I saw people praying rosaries, and I was, you know, it was like, you know, the light bulb goes off, oh my gosh, it's a rosary. That's what it was. That's what caused the abortions to fail. You know, I never knew that's what, if, if, if Jesus or if God had put it in my head that it was a rosary, we would have probably stopped doing abortions during regular business hours because that's when you guys show up with your rosaries. Not enough, evidently, because, you know, there's a lot more kids we could save out there. So what's your opinion about the new laws that are coming out this year? Abortion seems to be kind of slipping from our pro-life grasp, and, and it's just frustrating. Well, you know, in my book, I, I mentioned that um, the way that we fight abortion in this country is Einstein's definition of insanity. You know, it, it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. You know, we... we you know, in 1973, we decided, hey, let's send some people to march in Washington, D.C., and, and let's change some laws and see what we can do. You know, and when we first started, we sent a few thousand people. This year, we sent a million people. Now, you have to go and march because you have to present to the world that this is unacceptable. But you can't keep marching and think that's going to work because we keep doing it. And then the next year, abortion is legal, same right. as it always is. And then what do we do? We send more people to march and we write new laws. And Christianity is the majority and Catholic is the majority of that. And they go in there proud of their faith and they pull that curtain and vote for the enemy. Right, right. That's why, well. It was like 40% of the people that voted for Obama were Catholic. Yeah. He was like the most abortion-friendly president we've had. And you know why they, they continue to do that? Because the church won't tell them what they're doing, what they're jeopardizing. And it's black and white to me, no pun intended. But if you're voting for anyone that is pro-choice, you're voting for Satan's. Right. It's just, you know, and why don't they know that? You know, they, they kind of got their hands tied. I understand there's a lot more laws and rules, you know, that I don't know, but it's enough to make me angry, and I'll fight right alongside of you. Thank I you. appreciate you coming out. Is there anything else you need to make sure that, that people find out here, know about Zachary King? Um, do you have time to read the, uh, the letter in the, in the back of the book? It's like the final two pages. April 3rd, 2017? Yes. To whom it may concern, for the past several years I have known Mr. Zachary King and have been impressed by his testimony of how God rescued him from the kingdom of darkness and brought him into the kingdom of light, from the service of Satan to the service of the true God, and from supporting abortion to supporting the protection of every life, born and unborn. I praise God for Zachary's testimony and urge everyone to listen to it, for those who serve the Lord, it will be a blessing of encouragement. For those unsure of their path in life, it will be a guiding light. For those who still are trapped in darkness, it will be a clear summons to come to Christ. My prayer is that both Zachary and all those who hear his story will enjoy the fullness of God's protection and life. Very nice. Sincerely, Father Frank Pavone. So, the uh, spiritual warfare, any hints, suggestions for those who need to join the battle? Because you were asked, not everybody gets the blessed mother to invite them to the army. <laughs> so, you know, the, the spiritual warfare, you know, I think that's why I was asked to do this because I'm intrigued by it. You know, I mean, it's one of those things that not everybody's comfortable with. And, you know, here I am, send me, Lord. You know, what can I do? We've... Um my CD set came out in December 2015, and we have shut down 39 abortion clinics around the world, including in Louisiana, there's two abortion clinics left. Praise so, God. 
So we've, we've, um, we're, we're doing the best we can, um, you know, but if somebody wants to check out my website, it's allsaintsministry.org, and I have um, videos on my YouTube channel, and, you know, if you don't want to buy the CD set or buy the book, I have videos that tell you the different steps for how to shut down an abortion clinic through spiritual warfare. Or you can call me directly and ask me and I'll tell you. So how long have you lost your sight? I started going blind in 2012. And completely gone now? I mean, I know you have uh, a handler and a cane and it's tough to get around, but uh, wow, the Lord is obviously running your life and you're happy and at peace. I mean, I, I've talked to you a couple times now and it's noticeable. You know, I mean, even though you have you know, troubles with, you know, our, our senses. Right, but, you know, my life is so much better working for God than it was working for the devil. Amen. And, you know, I, I, I know who wins in the end. I, I, so does the Blessed Mother, isn't that cool? <laughs> She's a cool lady. That's beautiful. Well, Zach... King, here, I'm going to shake your hand. Thank you for coming in and spending a little time with us and, and, and explaining that, folks, no matter what you think you've done, this man here can tell you that he can beat you at doing things that he shouldn't have done and, and bad stuff. But as the prodigal son was coming, God ran and met him, and now he's using this soldier in spiritual warfare and... It's fantastic. So the sacraments, get back to confession. You can and will be forgiven. doesn't matter what you've done. Now, did you have a problem with that thinking, how are they going to possibly forgive me? No, I, I truly believe that God could forgive anything. Were you baptized before or did you get that too? No, I was baptized. Okay. That would have been nice as, though. As a get, get that blood stuff off of you. you know. <laughs> fantastic. Well, until we do this again, thank you again. That's Zachary King. My name is Matt Logman. This is SJEN TV, where it's a good day to be Catholic.